Good morning, everyone. Over the last week, we've talked about the challenges that all businesses and too many workers still face, and this is particularly true in the hospitality sector. Even though we've opened up restaurants and lodging to 50% and allowed travel without quarantine from counties in the Northeast with a low case count, these businesses still aren't bringing in enough customers to make ends meet. And this isn't just about the businesses and the tax revenue they generate, it's about their employees' livelihood. Our most recent numbers show that at least 10,000 hospitality workers remain out of work. This makes up about a quarter of all those covered by traditional unemployment insurance. Many of the places they work are on the edge. And even if all the money I proposed in my economic development package was passed and appropriated, it wouldn't be enough for them to survive without customers. So as I previewed on Wednesday, Mr. Pichek has been working with our EPI team to identify where we can safely expand our trusted travel map, meaning we would apply our 400 active cases per million threshold to more states and could welcome those from safe counties within driving distance to Vermont without a quarantine. Mr. Pichek will show you this new map in a few minutes, but beginning July 1, we will include counties in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland, Delaware, Virginia, West Virginia, and Ohio. It will also include D.C. Now, I want to be clear. This does not open up travel for the whole state. It's a county by county uh, threshold. And it's just like our, our current map. It will be updated weekly on accd.vermont.gov. And if it doesn't, uh, and it doesn't mean uh, they can fly or take a bus here without quarantine. It's only if they drive here on their own. By welcoming people from low-risk low counties, uh, we can help support our hospitality sector and the thousands of jobs it provides for Vermonters. This is an important step to make, as our own data shows, uh, shows our low community spread and, most importantly, very few and often zero hospitalizations or deaths. Now, I also want to provide a brief update on playgrounds, as this came up the other day and is an important question from parents as well as their kids. ACCD has updated its guidance, which again, you can find at accd.vermont.gov to help playgrounds open in a safe way. The guidance is simple. And it covers uh, the same key practices we're asking of, uh, of everyday Vermonters. Keep six feet apart. Wash your hands. Stay home when sick. And wear a mask when you can. We'll be asking the operators of these sites to post signage of this guidance and to make hand washing or sanitizer available if possible. In closing, I just want to remind everyone how important it is to continue to follow our health guidance. Vermonters have done a great job throughout this crisis, but I can't say it enough. We all have a role to play. The more closely we follow the health guidance and the more self-responsibility we take, the better we can control spread and the more we'll be able to restart the economy and the social interactions that are critical to our way of life. So with that, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Pichek for an update on safe regions. Uh, thank you very much, Governor, and good morning, everyone. Uh, this week, we'll again first focus on the data from our past week here in Vermont, uh, and then discuss how our four reopening metrics are faring. Uh, and then finish by discussing national and regional trends and as the governor alluded to how these trends have allowed us to further expand our travel map uh, to include uh, much of the east coast as always for those watching at home you can find today's presentation on our website uh, dfr.vermont.gov under our covid 19 resource page over the last week we saw 56 new confirmed cases in vermont and at this time, at least 35 of those cases were related to an outbreak or cluster, with the remaining 21 not. 
The most recent Vermont forecast shows that we can continue to expect low level case growth over the next two weeks. And overlaid on that forecast uh, are both the total cases and then specifically the cases that are not associated with an outbreak or a cluster. As you can see, the non-outbreak cases are trending below our forecast. However, we do see our total cases are slightly exceeding our forecast, which is really not all that unexpected when we consider the handful of outbreaks and clusters the health department is currently managing. But again, overall, we can anticipate a continued low level uh, growth rate over the next few weeks. Again, we thought it might be important to provide some context uh, to viewers uh, and believe that it's helpful to compare ourselves with states that have had a similar disease growth in the past, mainly Hawaii, Montana, and Alaska. Back on May 15th, uh, we pointed out the similarities among these states with each state experiencing a peak around the same time, each peak being relatively mild, and then each state settling into a period of very low growth. Similarly, during the last month or so, each one of these states has also been dealing with outbreaks and clusters associated with long-term care facilities, work sites, family living arrangements, and the like. You can see clearly from this slide that we are not the only state seeing this pattern, and the similarities are actually very remarkable. You'll also notice Vermont is doing a good job at containing these outbreaks and these clusters, and this is really all to say that we should expect to continue to see these sorts of situations as we continue to reopen the economy, and it only reinforces just how important testing, contact tracing, and isolation policies are to staying ahead of these situations. Turning now to our four reopening metrics, we continue to see good progress across the board. The percentage of Vermonters reporting COVID-like symptoms to emergency rooms or urgent care facilities is held stable this week between 0.5 and 1.5%, and today sits at just 0.63%, all well below our 4% guardrail. The three and seven day viral growth rates have also held steady this week. Both remain under 1%, and neither demonstrates the sort of sustained growth that would give us pause for concern. Regarding test positivity, we saw some volatility this week associated with the recent outbreaks. However, the positivity rate never exceeded 3%, and on a seven-day rolling average sits at 1.28%, uh, again, well below the 5% guardrail uh, that we've established for ourselves. Our fourth metric is hospital and critical care bed availability. Vermont's ICUs remain free of a COVID-19 patient, uh, and this has been the case for over a month, which in and of itself is quite remarkable. Additionally, our non-ICU hospital capacity remains high, and we've also seen a very limited number of COVID-19 patients needing hospital care over the past month. However, the last two days, we have exceeded our 30% ICU buffer, but as the last three uh, indicators just indicated, uh, we are trending very low and in the right direction and do not anticipate needing ICU facilities anytime uh, in the near future. So this is not a cause for concern at this time. Turning now to our national and regional trends, you know, certainly across the country, we've seen a, and heard about a steady increase in new COVID-19 cases, leading some states to pause their reopening uh, plans. But we wanna put this growth into some context. As you can see, the South and the West regions, which had a much smaller peak in April, are now starting to grow at a considerable clip. The South is now essentially where the Northeast was when New York was experiencing its peak in the month of April. In fact, the South is now on pace to eclipse the Northeast in terms of total cumulative cases in the very short term. And again, you can see that both the South and the West regions remain on trajectories of rapid growth. And these include states, obviously, that we've talked about like Arizona and Texas and uh, Florida, but they also include states like uh, California that is experiencing uh, considerable growth uh, over the last uh, few weeks. But again, as we pointed out in the past, the Northeast continues to see improvement, uh, both as the previous charts have shown uh, and as our sort of Northeast uh, regional view shows as well. Uh, over the last week, we had an 18% reduction in new cases across the Northeast, uh, and we also had a 13% reduction in active cases 
within a five hour radius of Vermont's borders. This has all allowed us to turn our attention to expanding the travel map that we have set out for the last few weeks. And we're happy to say, as the governor pointed out, uh, that we are expanding the map to include uh, many of the states that are within a reasonable driving distance of Vermont, including Ohio, Pennsylvania, uh, New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, West Virginia, and Virginia, and also the District of Columbia. With the addition of these states and the counties that meet the threshold, uh, there are now about 19 million people that can travel to Vermont uh, free of a quarantine requirement. The regional population is about 85 million, so it is a significant percentage of the regional population. And again, the forecast uh, is only improving in this area. We saw improvement across the Northeast uh, this week. We only have seven counties that are mapped uh, red in the Northeast on our map. Uh, that includes counties that have moved into sort of that yellow zone in both uh, New York City uh, and Boston uh, metro areas. So we anticipate seeing continued improvement uh, over the weeks ahead uh, with uh, many more visitors being allowed to enter Vermont uh, without a quarantine, which is certainly uh, good news for the lodging industry. So with that, at this time, I would like to uh, turn it over to Dr. Levine. Good morning, everyone. I'll begin with an update on uh, our outbreaks and then um, a few small um, rules that we can adopt and then a little bit about uh, some new information regarding people who are at increased risk uh, for more severe illness with COVID. As you saw in the uh, slides, uh, there was a slight uptick in cases over the course of the week, but really the Winooski Burlington outbreak is at 115 cases. And if you look at that over the course of a week in terms of the growth, it was perhaps seven cases. Things are really still on the uh, downslope, on the epi curve, and uh, there's no indication that there is marked expansion. So now we're in that period of time where we're just trying to document new cases, um, look at the incubation period of the virus being 14 days, and hopefully see this continue to lessen and lessen with time. Really nothing new on the characteristics of the cases uh, in aggregate to report from previously. We reported last time on a cluster in uh, Wyndham County, which still remains a cluster confined essentially to a family and uh, no expansion of that since the last time we talked. And then finally, um, what we discussed about Fairhaven previously. Currently, there are 12 cases associated with that though I would caution people that more testing is occurring today uh, at the work site. The uh, number of people total in the outbreak cases plus contacts is 22, but again, that's before we do further testing today. And no hospitalizations, no deaths. It's noteworthy that of the 12 cases, only two are Vermont residents. The other 10 are residents of New York State. Our health department has been working very closely with the Washington County Health Department in New York um, to um, make sure that all the appropriate contact tracing uh, continues to occur. I know people are interested in the workplace itself, and I have to say again that I cannot convey the name of the work site as that would be identifying to the individuals who work there, especially in light of the very small number of Vermonters, only two affected thus far. I will reassure everyone that all are actively isolating and quarantining. And as I've stated, we are working very closely as a health department with the New York State uh, Department counterpart. I do want to make a specific statement for the benefit of the public. 
Again, to be reassuring, but not to be falsely reassuring. Whenever we hear about outbreaks or clusters, we understand everyone has a desire to know more. It may make you feel safer, but feeling safer isn't necessarily the same as being safer. The way we keep Vermonters safe is by talking to people who have tested positive, learning who they were in close contact with. It's not someone who you just passed by in the grocery store. It's their families, their friends, maybe their coworkers. The whole concept of contact tracing, of course, finding people who are in close contact and could be at risk of getting COVID. If we find through contact tracing that you could be at risk, the health department contacts you. Only if the risk occurred in a public setting where people could have been put at risk and could not otherwise be found would the health department make a public announcement. In fact, if you look at what we're requiring of restaurants right now when people are dining in, um, they are keeping a roster of everyone who dined on a certain date, just with that in mind. Next, I'm not going to reiterate um, the sort of four rules that the governor presented and that we've talked about many times here, but just go back to the concept of contact and sort of three rules of contact. First one is common sense. If you're in one-to-one -one close contact with someone, whether that be a healthcare provider, a hairdresser, a friend, doesn't really matter. The goal is that you keep those kinds of contacts to a minimum. And certainly use facial covering and as much physical distancing as is reasonable in that contact. And that's where we have this whole concept of trusted households. So there may be households you will have closer contact with than the vast majority of those in your community, and that's fine. Um, because you've made an agreement implicitly with that household that you're both bringing low risk to the encounter. Second rule is about what I call contact density, which essentially means avoid crowded places. It's the reason we're not yet having uh, mass gatherings of a thousand people together uh, where there is little opportunity for physical distancing. Um, and the risk of transmission of disease from just a few people would be high. Again, when you're in those kinds of conditions and it's indoors, facial covering is very much important. And then the third part is what I call contact duration or intensity. Really how long you're in contact with someone. And obviously, if it's a higher risk, proposition, you want to be there for less time. It's frankly why we don't worry when you walk into a very large store where there may be a lot of people, but where you can still kind of physically distance, and you're not going to be in there long because you're there for a purpose, you're going to look for what you need, and then you're going to buy it and leave. It's a lot different than if you're in a setting where everyone is together for a couple hours at a time, and you really do need to be very conscious then of your distance from people and how crowded and how long you are there. And you always want to watch the ventilation. So we always say outdoors is better than indoors. Outdoors is pretty free ventilation. Indoors, uh, most ventilation will be good. And if you're in a large auditorium, you're going to be aware of that. But if you're in a smaller room, uh, you need to be very conscious of how much ventilation is there in that room at the time. There's one concept that I didn't invent that I'd like to present, and it's called managing your exposure budget. An exposure budget is just what it says. It's how many of those three things are happening in your day, day to day. How close have you been to people? How much have you been in crowded circumstances? How long have you been there? And you need to think about that like you think about other things in your life that may have some risk to them and sort of manage your risk accordingly and make trade-offs. 
So if you're going to visit your elderly mother and you're really concerned that you don't bring disease in that unwittingly that you might bring in, that might not be the time that you're going to be at a crowded event at the same day or in, within those couple of days. Likewise, if you're uh, really wanting to go to some event that you normally might have thought twice about, you might do that event and then in the rest of your life not do too many other things that are gonna replicate that. It's kind of like when you're on a diet and you've decided I'm having a piece of birthday cake today uh, and that breaks every rule in my diet, but I'm gonna do something different later today or tomorrow uh, because I'm aware of the fact that I have to make some trade-offs here and it's still important for me to celebrate that event. Last thing I want to talk about is that the Centers for Disease Control has just published an expanded list of people who are at an increased risk of severe illness with COVID. And I want to put some of those things in perspective and just give you an idea of what they're all about. And this is besides the usual things we say about age. It's besides the known things like a heart disease, lung diseases like uh, emphysema, and uh, diabetes and being immunocompromised. So the additional items on the list that should make, if you have one of them, give you pause as you uh, begin to try to apply the rules that we've uh, given you to live your life include obesity, which we kind of knew before, but it's now more prominently displayed, if you will, uh, chronic kidney disease, sickle cell disease. And then there are a number of conditions where, frankly, there is still less certainty, but people should at least think about things. Asthma, stroke, hypertension, dementia, and other neurological conditions, liver disease like cirrhosis, and having a smoking or vaping habit. And I've pointed out many times here about the fact that smoking or vaping can give more severe complications of someone uh, if they contract COVID. So always worth thinking about that. And the final one, again, I'm only talking about it not to create mass hysteria, but also to put it in perspective because you're gonna be hearing about it on the news and reading about it, is pregnancy. Pregnancy is one that people have talked about up until this point as probably not having much increase in risk. Well, now it's being talked about as a little uncertain still, but possibly having a slight increase in having a worse outcome. More severe disease in the woman who is pregnant, perhaps more risk of a complication like a premature birth. Um, in the uh, offspring of that individual. So this needs to be balanced very carefully. It doesn't mean a mass message, don't get pregnant. Um, be fearful if you are pregnant. It's just, again, you may want to make your exposure budget err on the side of much less exposure because of that. Um, and just consider that as you factor in how you live your life day to day. There was some recent literature indicating there may be more hospitalizations in those who are pregnant than those who are not. That data is being questioned a bit because it turns out if you are pregnant, there's a very low threshold for admitting pregnant women to the hospital when it comes to concerns about their pregnancy. Forget about another illness, just about their pregnancy. And if you don't account for that increase in hospitalization that pregnancy alone leads to, uh, you might be misled into thinking COVID is causing more hospitalizations. So stay tuned on that one. That needs to be sorted out a little bit better yet. I'll stop my comments there and return it to the governor. Thank you, Dr. Levine. Uh, we'll open up to questions at this time. Okay, we'll start with Calvin. All right, thank you, Governor. So, um, I guess when it comes to people coming from out of state, it's good that we're opening up uh, hotels and those accommodations, but restaurants still are suffering. They have a lot of overhead costs.
costs. And what they say they need is the capacity limit lifted uh, above 50%. Um, I guess when, when will we see any traction on that? And when, what does the data have to look like for us to open up? Yeah, again, as you know, I've been uh, trying to move us towards a uh, percentage basis. We were at 25% at one point in time. Uh, most sectors have been opened up to 50%. We got to have a couple more to go. I'd like to do that by July 1. Uh, and then, you know, just continue to watch the, the data, all the things, the factors uh, that Commissioner Pichek laid out uh, and, uh, and listen to science and data. And it, if we continue to move in the right direction or, or we're stable, uh, then we can we can push the envelope a little bit more. We can open up a little bit more. But at this point in time, uh, getting to 50%, uh, allowing more uh, traffic into the state, which is what uh, we're told, even uh, restaurants, uh, lodging, and so forth, really do need at this right now because there's not enough capacity within the state or not enough uh, people within the state as customers uh, to to satisfy their overhead. So. Again, it's going to be a measured approach. Um, we're just going to wait and see. I can't put a, uh, a timeline on it uh, just to say we want to open up just as quick as we safely can. And the legislative session is, in theory, wrapping up today. I think it might go a little bit into next week. But I'm just wondering sort of if you had any thoughts on sort of how the session went uh, and, and maybe any bills that you would have liked to see that maybe did or didn't pass. Well, the, the beauty of what we have right now is that it's going to be um, somewhat of a short recess. Uh, they'll be back, uh, as I understand, sometime uh, in uh, late August. Uh, and then we'll go back and take a look at, at what the next three quarters of the year are going to look at. We'll be able to present our budget, uh, you know, an expanded budget at that point. Uh, and there'll be uh, continued uh, initiatives that could be brought forward. We'll have a better idea of how the economy is doing, how we're doing with the uh, the COVID response, uh, and uh, things that we may need of them uh, as well uh, in terms of the rest of the money, the economic package that uh, we put forth. Um, they didn't uh, they didn't adopt all of the measures that I had laid out, but there's still time to do that in uh, you know a month and a half or so. So. Um, Again, we'll see. I haven't, uh, I haven't seen all of the bills. They, they passed a number of them this week. And um, so we'll have to go through those and see uh, what, what is in them uh, because we haven't been, uh, you know, it's, it's been a lot to keep up with uh, for them and for us uh, in, in, as well as trying to keep up with the, the COVID response at the same time. And specifically, I'm just thinking about the Global Warming Solutions Act that passed through. Um, I guess, what, what were your thoughts on that? Well, again, uh, that's an uh, initiative that passed the Senate, uh, I understand, last night. And um, now it's being sent back to the House. They have to, they made some changes. They'll have to uh, determine whether they'll, they'll adopt those or not. Uh, and I don't know what's in it um, completely. So we'll, uh, we'll take a look and decide uh, what action I'll take from there. I had some concerns about it, uh, but they may have alleviated that. I just don't know. Uh, Governor, just uh, I guess kind of an update on what you're telling Vermonters looking to leave the state maybe for vacations as we're seeing the July Fourth weekend as we're getting later in the summer here. What does the reciprocity look like of um, you know can can Vermonters go to other states uh, and not quarantine there? Yeah, um, here's the only thing I, I know um, for sure is that Maine uh, has a recipro reciprocity uh, agreement with us in, in concept. Uh, they've uh, they've said that they would open up to Vermont visitors to come to their state. I believe New Hampshire may be the same, but I'm not positive of that. The rest, uh, I think uh, everyone would have to check with those states uh, to make sure we're adhering to their quarantine requirements. A number of the Northeast states uh, did have uh, quarantine requirements. I know uh, New Hampshire, Maine, uh, Mass, uh, and others uh, had those. Uh, so. I don't know. Uh, we ha I haven't spoken to any of the other states to see about any formal reciprocity. Uh, but again, I would just urge everyone to check uh, their sites uh, to make sure that you're adhering to them. Uh, otherwise, stay here in Vermont. Uh, we, uh, we have a lot to offer. Uh, explore the state a little bit. Uh, you'll find a lot of opportunity right here in our own backyard. So if you don't have to travel, don't. Uh, stay here and uh, and spend uh, your your hard-earned money right here in the state. And just to be clear, the, the main situation is not for sure yet. That's just so you're still talking about here. 
Well, no, I think uh, I think Governor Mills uh, had said uh, before. I just don't know if the, if the date, uh, maybe Commissioner Pichuk today. Yeah. Okay, it's enacted today. Uh, so I knew that she had uh, said that she we were a trusted neighbor, and they would open up uh, the border to us, and uh, I believe New Hampshire as well. Um, so um, so that is uh, as of today. All right, we'll go to the phone, starting with Ann Wallace-Allen at VT Digger. Hi there. Um, so this is a lot of good news that we're hearing out of Vermont, but there's also a lot of very disturbing news that we are all hearing from other states. And I know that our economy relies on the other states uh, to function. As you mentioned, it's tourism, but it's also manufacturing and lots of other things. And I'm just wondering, are you, are, you, um, are you thinking that we're all going to go into a recession here? I mean, it doesn't seem as though Vermont would be immune from the financial problems that are going to affect the rest of the country. Yeah, we're, we're definitely not immune uh, to the fa financial situation uh, the rest of the country is facing. Uh, we're facing it here. Uh, that was why uh, we uh, put that $400 million economic package out there, uh, because I do believe uh, there's going to be some rough times ahead. Uh, we just have to prepare for that and we have to uh, to do all we can to leverage all the assets we have uh, in any way uh, possible uh, to prevent as much uh, as, as much of uh, what we're you know anticipating as possible um, so yeah this could have an effect on us uh, as well and it will so we're uh, um, go ahead uh, do you think we're in any better position to weather a recession now than we were uh, last time around, like if I, I don't know if the state learned any lessons from it, or are we just in any way different? Because well, it took us a really long time to recover from the last one. Yeah. In fact, we still had them in some ways. Yeah. Again, we're going to have to do things differently. I, I think that uh, we have to uh, to be aware that we're not on an island. Uh, that we do uh, uh, need uh, the rest of the states uh, in uh, Quebec, uh, in particular, in Canada. Uh, looking forward to them, uh, to the border opening back up there. That could be uh, a great deal to us here in the States in a number of different ways, uh, in, in Vermont in particular. Um, so we'll, um, we, we built up our reserves. Uh, good news there. Uh, we did, over the last three years, uh, some of the initiatives that we put into place. Uh, you know, the first couple of years, no new taxes and fees. Uh, we had surpluses on the bottom line. We were, we were on our on a course uh, to have a, a surplus this year, um, which um, got us through in some respects uh, fiscal year 20, uh, which is going to end in a few days, uh, a few, uh, next week. Um, so we're, we're okay to that point. It's just the next two or three years ahead. So uh, the reserves we put into place, uh, the initiatives that we've uh, we've outlined. Uh, we're just going to have to become very creative uh, and uh, be objective and do all we can uh, to uh, to make sure that we again leverage all the assets we have uh, to uh, to weather this next uh, this next storm um all right thanks if you don't mind could i just also ask dr levine a question sure um it, it seems as though in other states people get their their covid 19 test results back a lot faster than they do here in vermont where it's um, from what I can tell, it takes a couple of days. Is there any reason for that, or is that even that observation even correct? Yeah, thank you. That that observation is correct for some people, and so if it's correct for some people, that's important to us. Uh, I'm hoping it's not correct for the majority of people, though. Um, one of the uh, points that the testing task force that has been, I think couple weeks now uh, working together uh, to remedy is this issue of rapidity of finding out test results. The reality is a positive test result is generally found out very quickly within 48 hours and usually within 24. It's those people who want to be to receive confirmation that not hearing is truly a negative result that are sometimes waiting days. So that's a big issue. One thing that we've done to remedy that um, is that it turns out with the number of pop-ups we've been doing and the number of Vermonters who have wanted to be tested, um, there are so many negative results that come in on a given day. 
because obviously we're doing well over a thousand tests a day and the majority of them are negative, thank goodness, um, that uh, we need to expand an entire bank of people to call uh, results in a more rapid fashion. So we're implementing that to make sure that we can try to catch up and be as fast as possible uh, in this process. But your question you is right. Like a call it is. Center? What's that? You mean like you're setting up a call? Uh, you're in, you're making a call center. You're setting up a call center. Yes. And bringing in employees who don't have contact tracing as their main job. You know, because those employees have to focus obviously on those tasks at hand. We can't rely on just sending a letter. Is the bottom line. Uh, we send the letter because you need to have a documentation of your result, but that can often prove to be too many days gone by for the comfort of the person who wants to know that they're truly negative, or for their not just comfort, but pragmatically, if they're trying to get out of quarantine uh, on day seven, if they need a result so they can proceed on with a uh, procedure of some sort, what have you. So we're well aware of this and uh, working very constructively. Alrighty, thanks so much. Courtney, Local 22. Governor, um, particularly about travel, as we're letting more travelers in, we're seeing neighboring states like New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut um, increasing quarantine orders. Are you at all concerned with travelers coming from hotspot states and how exactly are travelers being monitored when they come into the Green Mountain State? Well, actually, we've had our quarantine policy in place since the very beginning. Um, there, those other three states you mentioned are just implementing theirs. Ours have been in place. The 14-day quarantine period has been there from the start. So, uh, yes, we're, we're concerned about those hot spots. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the states that we even outlined uh, where we're uh, allowing them to come in different counties within the state uh, that meet our threshold. So that's the, the key point here. You know, we have a 400-person uh, uh, per million active uh, uh, COVID uh, case count uh, that we, uh, we, met, we want to uh, adhere to. Uh, so um, I feel comfortable with our, our policy. Uh, we've been doing it from the very start and we'll continue to do so. Ours is probably a little stricter than theirs at this point. Okay, um, and one more thing with early voting starting today in Vermont, um, can you touch on, do you think the new practice of mail-in voting will be successful? Well, I'm still, actually, it's interesting, still waiting for the bill, uh, the, the urgent uh, elections bill that they had, uh, had implemented or talked about and passed a, a while ago. We haven't seen it yet. So I, um, I, I think that, um, Voting uh, by mail is safe. Uh, I think people should do that if they can, and uh, so we'll we'll see. But I, I don't I don't know what the uh, Secretary of State is doing at this point. I, I'm assuming that he's implemented the um, vote by mail for the November election, but I don't think he had ever intended to have vote by mail um, mandatory vote by mail for the primary. Okay. Thank you. Avery, WCAX. My question is for Commissioner Harrington. We're just hearing that there um, have been some delays in unemployment benefits this week. Uh, one viewer mentioned to us that theirs was five days late. Just wondering if there have been any delays and if so, uh, why? Uh, thanks for the question. I I'm not aware of any um, systemic uh, delays in the system. You know, we continue to work through issues on various claims, but um, those are, are relatively unique to any one particular claim. It can happen for a variety of reasons. So I'm happy to, to check with my team and, and follow up if, if there was some issue that delayed a bulk amount of uh, payments from being processed, but I'm not aware of anything at this time. Avery, was that uh, okay, thank was, you. was that more than more than one person or, or multiple people who had uh, contacted your station? We just have one viewer at this point. Okay, I, if you have a question about that, uh, give either the labor department a call 
or give us a call at 828-3333 and we'll try and track that down. Yeah, I would, I would say, Avery, certainly if you wanted to also send, uh, send me the person, we can certainly follow up with that one person, as the governor said. So, um, you know, if, if it's an issue that's not getting resolved, we'll make sure it gets handled. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that it wasn't a larger systemic issue as well. Thank you. Thank you. Kevin, seven days. Hi, Governor. Thanks for taking the call. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, good morning, Kevin. Good morning. It's a bit of a multi-part question, but it involves the county-by-county county distinction. Last time you announced um, this, this measure, there were maybe 55 counties. Could we get that number now um, at some point? And then a follow-up to that is um, there seems to be some shading in the uh, Vermont map and does that suggest that there are still some counties in Vermont presently that would not allow people to travel here if they were in another state and can you explain that yeah I'll let Commissioner Pichak handle that yeah thanks for the question so there are about 500 counties that are subject now to the quarantine and about 260 of those are green counties eligible uh, for travel into Vermont? As we said, about 19 million people live in those 260 counties. So that um, is the answer to the first question. As to the second, we did update the map uh, to include the same type of gradation uh, in terms of under 400, 400 to 800, and over 800, just for clarity and information so people can see that. But the travel policy doesn't apply to Vermont. So it doesn't matter if um, a county's over that threshold, if you're considering going out of Vermont or someone's coming into Vermont. Uh, as we've mentioned in the past, we're using those four uh, surveillance measures um, to more closely monitor Vermont. And this active case count is really a proxy for risk that is easy for us to sort of monitor and to communicate. But we're looking at those other four uh, metrics uh, much more closely with much more uh, data. So I guess, does that seem internally inconsistent to anyone that someone from Franklin County uh, could do a day trip or travel within the state and not have to say what county they're from or whether they've quarantined or not, whereas somebody from out of the state is, is held to those requirements? So the reason that we don't believe that it's, uh, you know, sort of counter is that we really have a good sense of what's going on in our state, a much greater degree than we do in all the states around us. So we're familiar with the outbreak in Winooski and Burlington, familiar with the one in Rutland. And we can say, you know, with uh, greater confidence than we can with any of the states around us, that those are limited to outbreaks or clusters and not broader community transmission, which we certainly cannot say in the states around us. So that's why that distinction is important. Okay, that makes sense. And then the last question is just, isn't contact tracing become infinitely harder if you now have to track uh, people from 260 counties uh, in uh, various other states? And does that give you pause in any way? Or do you think you've got that under control? So I'll let uh, Dr. Levine answer that question. All right, thank you, Commissioner. Contact tracing is complex. So let's put that on the table first. And it does require uh, an empathetic person who gives an individual time and allows them to process what's going on with their own condition as well as who do they come into contact with. Um, but with regard to the greater 260 counties, um, generally um, my assumption is a person would be leaving Vermont and going back to the county they came from as opposed to staying in Vermont. If they're staying in Vermont and have been contact traced and they're going to quarantine in Vermont, uh, that would be handled by our health department. If they're identified as a contact by our health department but they're already in their home state, our health department would do just what it's doing down in Rutland County right now, which is work closely with the adjoining health department and their department would be responsible for pursuing that contact tracing further. It kind of all depends on where the person was at the time and um, who they were in contact with at the time they knew they were a contact. Is that clear? Okay, it is, thanks very much. I think 
it, it also is a, is a great segue to to making sure that everyone knows and let's let's put some perspective on this we have the fourth lowest number of cases in the nation right now um, and we have been uh, consistent consistently montana uh, is the lowest alaska hawaii and then vermont um, so we have a lot to be proud of um, a lot to be thankful for and uh, we re we remain committed uh, to staying in that top five Excellent. Thank you, Governor. All right, Chris, Newport Daily Express. Chris Roy, Newport Daily Express. Star six to unmute, Chris. All right, we'll move to Wilson at the AP. Um, hi, as always, happy Friday, and thanks for the opportunity. I have a couple of questions here. I'm real interested in uh, the slide that Mike had about the small states. I've been watching those small states for a long time, and I've been curious what's going on with them. What do you see as any, and you could probably add Wyoming to that list, too. What do you see as any common themes, if any, to these, to what's been happening here? And then my second question is, uh, I guess it's for Dr. Levine, but with all this good news, you, relatively speaking, that we've been looking at for a while, what would be a red flag or what could be something that would happen that would really give you cause for concern as you started to see new cases in mm -hmm. who knows what conditions? I guess that's my condition, but that's the question. So I'll anyway, let, thank you. Yeah, I'll let Commissioner Pichak answer first. I think Wyoming is actually number five in the nation. Yeah, so Wilson, thanks for that question. And we have the, the slide up here for those watching. But you can see, uh, as we pointed out, that you know there are three really key similarities. One is that the peaks, the timing of the peaks were all relatively consistent. If you looked at the peaks around New England, I mean, you would see a very different trajectory. Uh, Maine and New Hampshire have a very different trajectory than Vermont does. Uh, but then you see that the peaks were also relatively mild. You know, this is uh, somewhere between, you know, 30 to 70 cases at their peak, uh, depending on these four states. And then you saw uh, sustained low growth, uh, you know, sort of during the period of time when, uh, when uh, folks were either reopening their economy or people were staying at home, whether under order or just under concern for their health. So, you know, those are definitely the similarities. And then more recently, when you see these outbreaks occurring, you know, it's a very similar story. If you scan their media, you see that they're experiencing outbreaks at work sites, at nursing homes, long-term care facilities, family uh, living arrangements, that they're dealing with these very similar types of outbreaks and clusters that are occurring, um, and they are working to keep those contained uh, and under control. Uh, so that is also a similarity as these states that had really low case growth, so they have a high degree of, you know, um, of the population that is still vulnerable to getting the virus. Uh, as they start to reopen their economy, these these outbreaks are just sort of bound to happen. Uh, but again, the important thing is to make sure that contact tracing, the testing, and the uh, and the isolation policies are there. Okay, good for that. One. Thank you very much. That's a good answer. Now it's my turn. Um, so um, you're kind of asking me the question of what makes me lose sleep at night, but um, yeah. The fact of the matter is, uh, I, I really want to begin the answer to the question to just call out all of the teams in the Department of Health and across state government that have made testing and contact tracing successful to the degree that they are right now. Because it is so reassuring to know that we're doing uh, the, uh, not the mandated, but the recommended um, even above the recommended level of testing of our state and that we have the capacity to do all of the contact tracing uh, because that has to be a given uh, to feel good about things. The things I would feel bad about are the things that uh, Commissioner Pichak portrays on his slides every Friday, but I would probably feel not so bad about the hospitalization rates and the ICU beds uh, because when you're worrying about those, you're way too late. You've missed, you've missed the ball. 
uh, and it's a really serious situation. It's kind of what's happening in Arizona, unfortunately, now, um, and to some degree in Texas. Um, I worry about the much more early things, um, which are on this slide, one, two, and three, uh, because they really do help us understand when the viral activity in the population is increasing. What I don't worry about is having a Winooski Burlington outbreak, having a Fairhaven outbreak, having a cluster in Brattleboro. That is what we've tried to message pretty broadly is our new normal. Uh, because the virus isn't going anywhere. It's here to stay, and we just need to work our way in through time until there's a vaccine. So I don't worry about those things. I worry if we didn't have the testing capacity to fully identify what's within those outbreaks, and if we didn't have the contact tracing capacity to fully identify who's at risk and who's at risk of putting other people at risk so that we do the right thing early on and make sure that no one else is a, at any risk for a more widespread community transmission. Sound good? Great, thank you very much. All right, Tim, Vermont Business Magazine. Governor, I'm gonna back up a little bit on the uh, Global Warming Solutions Act, because um, there's a lot of concern out there about it, whether it will pass, what it will mean. Uh, the, the Senate passed its version of the bill without the million dollar funding, but it was pretty overwhelming in both the House and the Senate. And I think uh, uh, the listeners would be interested in whether you would veto the bill as, as you know it, uh, either the House or the Senate version, frankly. And, and what, it, what is your general uh, impression about it, too? It seems like they have an overwhelming majority that would override a, a veto at this point. I just want to get your a better sense of what you're thinking about at this point. Yeah, again, Tim, without knowing all the intricate details of the of the bill, we had, as you know, concerns along the way. Uh, we were making some some ground, some headway. Uh, I think uh, Secretary Moore uh, had uh, had had communicated that uh, to both the House and the Senate. And uh, and again, I thought we were making some ground, but I don't know what was included in the end. Uh, some of the uh, the threat of uh, suing the state, putting the, the state at financial risk uh, in the not too distant future was of concern uh, to me, as well as having the resources to do everything they wanted us to do as an administration. That's concerning, especially when we're facing these budget deficits and so forth, and we're going to have to tighten our belt. So uh, those those areas remain for me. Uh, you know, I believe, uh, um, Global, uh, the global warming is real. Uh, I, I do believe we have to to um, to change uh, the way we do business. Uh, we're, we've adopted many measures and um, proposed many uh, to do just that, and uh, we'll continue to, to have to advocate for that. But again, I can't <clears throat> I can't comment uh, on the uh, on the bills and whether I veto um, without seeing the details. We'll see, uh, you know, we'll, again, we'll see what happens uh, today, uh, whether the, the House uh, uh, agrees with the, uh, with the changes or not and puts it back, for, uh, back over or, or passes it, uh, and then, uh, or whether it comes back uh, in August or not. I just, I'm just not sure. I was, I was also curious as to whether uh, a bill was uh, basically veto-proof. Just, just philosophically in your part whether that would matter whether you veto or not veto a, a yeah. any bill or not um, well again I think I've, I've stated this over the last uh, uh, year and a half uh, that I do have a veto proof majority uh, in the House and the Senate uh, six Republicans in the out of 30 in the Senate I think it's 43 uh, in the House out of 150 uh, so they have the numbers uh, so I, I had said uh, consistently uh, that they can do pretty much anything they want to do, regardless of what I want, uh, and they've done a few of those. So, um, you know, we have to uh, play the cards we're dealt, uh, and it doesn't prevent me from uh, taking action or vetoing something that I don't think is in the best interest of Vermont. I'll continue to do that if, uh, if I think it's necessary. 
uh, but I have to accept reality at the same time. All right, great, thank you. Pete Hirschfeld, BPR. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, Governor, the legislature has landed on a yield bill that would see the Ed Fund end next year um, in the red by a projected $104 million, I believe. Um, are you amenable to a, a Ed funding plan um, that would rely on deficit spending to solve the, the short-term revenue crisis of the education fund? Yeah, it's an interesting question, uh, something that we've been talking internally uh, about. Uh, if there was one fund uh, where we could deficit spend, it's probably the Ed Fund. Um, so I'm not, um, I'm, I'm open uh, to at least considering that. I would like to see us uh, do everything we can to reduce the costs uh, because we know uh, we don't want to uh, to have taxpayers uh, bur be burdened uh, by this uh, this tremendous increase uh, in revenue needed for the Ed Fund. So. Um, we'll have to see. Uh, again, I uh, haven't spoken directly with the finance department or the um, the secretary of education on this uh, issue, but but I'm not um, I'm not saying no. Thank you, Guy Page. Hello, Governor. Uh, two questions today. When will our home health agencies? personal care attendants be allowed to resume routine visits to do housework, cooking meals, et cetera, for homebound Vermonters? Um, I'm going to ask Secretary Smith to answer that. Uh, that is a concern, uh, and it's, uh, it's a point uh, that, uh, that many have made, and we want to get back to uh, as near normal as possible in that regard. Secretary Smith? Guy, we don't have a time schedule right now, but we're looking at how to sort of return to the new normal. So the only thing I can say right now is as soon as possible. Um, at the same time, we want to make sure we have the protections in place that we need to as we, as we move forward. But um, the only thing I can tell you is as soon as possible. Okay, thank you. Uh, Governor, uh, regarding the new AOT policy on not removing most roadside messaging out of concern for racial sensitivity, uh, will the highway workers also be leaving untouched other comments, uh, opinion comments, such as maybe, you know, all lives matter, blue lives matter, unborn black lives matter? Uh, wh what can you tell us about that? Yeah, we're providing, uh, you, you know, we want to make sure uh, that we use common sense and are sensitive the times we're living in at this point. Uh, th this was, uh, this happened last week. As a result, I think you're aware uh, in uh, Jamaica, uh, there, was, uh, there was some etchings on the bridge with chalk, uh, actually. And, uh, and the uh, agency, uh, as they should, has been part of their guidance, removed that uh, almost immediately. Um, but in sensitivity uh, to what, uh, what we see across the country, uh, we think uh, at this point in time, uh, just to be using common sense, uh, allow the districts to to let people uh, express uh, some of this, uh, their frustration uh, and some of their, their viewpoints in that regard. Um, it'll be a case by case uh, basis uh, guy. I mean, it's not, it's, it's not going to be a perfect solution here and it may not be uh, forever in some respects. We wanna protect our infrastructure as well. Uh, we have a, um, obligation, uh, duty to do that. But again, let's just use some common sense. If it's uh, um, using chalk on, on uh, some, some concrete or on a street or so, so forth, I think that that should be acceptable as long as they adhere to. It's not uh, inflammatory, uh, it's not grotesque, uh, and so forth. There's some guidelines that you probably have the letter from um, our chief yeah. engineer, Wayne Simmons, that lays those uh, four criteria out. It's not across the board. You can do anything you want. But it also talked about not just chalk, but painting, uh, using paint, uh, being that being now permitted, which strikes me as a lot more permanent than, than chalk. Yeah, you know, it's uh, in interesting. I, I've lived in Washington County uh, here in, in this region for um, 
all my life thus far. And, uh, and over the last 25 years, I've gone through from Route 12 from Northfield into Montpelier, and there's been a uh, closed Vermont Yankee on the trestle there uh, for yeah. at least 20 years. Um, so it's not as though this is a new policy in some respects. I don't know why we haven't covered that up, but, uh, but it seems as though, you know, we're going to have to have, there's going to be some give and take. Uh, I don't want people uh, to just, uh, just to feel that they can go out and, and uh, cover everything up uh, in every area, but just use a little common sense uh, at this point and be sensitive uh, to what the country is going through and, and the need to have this conversation. Is this something, have you had conversations, uh, your administration, with the, the organizers of these rallies about what's, what's acceptable and what's not? Has there been any sort of discussions directly I, with them? There's been engagement. Uh, public safety, I think, does a, a really good job. The state police uh, have done a great job in trying to connect with the organizers of any of these events uh, to make sure that we, we know what's, what's happening, uh, what's, you know, what's acceptable, what's not. Uh, trying to to uh, be sensitive to their needs, uh, but at the same time trying to keep everyone safe. I think we've been successful uh, thus far. I mean, it, it, I've been very proud of uh, of everyone uh, for the way uh, that they've uh, treated each other, uh, respect and civility, uh, let the people exercise their First Amendment rights, uh, at the same time keeping everyone safe. So we've been fortunate here in Vermont, and I hope uh, we continue to do that. But it's going to take. Uh, a lot of us uh, working uh, together and listening to one another and, uh, and, and, and just be sensitive to that. So again, I think we've handled it uh, pretty well uh, and uh, I hope we continue to do so. All right, thank you. I'm gonna move to Kat at WCAX. Hi, I have a quick clarification um, with Fairhaven and then a question I'm gonna ask about the travel map. Fairhaven, of the dozen cases, two are Vermonters. I'm looking at the chart of test positive from the 23rd. Did those other 10 New York positive tests end up showing up in our Vermont test positive data from earlier this week? It was my understanding from my questioning last time that the New York resident test would not be counted in our numbers, and I want to make sure we frame this correctly. Right, so on the day that you commented, to our knowledge, there were cases that were in Vermont. Now that we have clarification, they will not show up as Vermont cases. Okay. Uh, the virus data that we're seeing in the South and West, um, if given what we know about that, if people have family events planned with guests that are going to be flying into Vermont or they themselves need to travel outside of Vermont, not within driving distance and then come back, should people assume that for the rest of the summer, if you're going to travel by plane, you will need to quarantine? I think that would be the best assumption uh, at this point in time until we develop uh, other policies. But as we've seen, you know, with outbreaks and, and the spikes uh, that we're seeing throughout the country, I think uh, it would be best if everyone just conditioned themselves uh, to, the, to the fact that we may have to quarantine if you're flying into the state. And then is that travel map about as large as it's gonna get for this summer? Because as you know, there's only so far you can reasonably drive to come get into Vermont. So I'm kind of wondering how that map is gonna look this summer and what businesses should take note of if they are in the travel and hospitality industry. Yeah, uh, at this point, um, you know, I, I can't see it expanding too much more because uh, that's about a 10, 10 hour drive, 10, one day drive uh, for most of those, uh, those locations. So. I'm not sure that we'll see a lot of uh, change there. The only other uh, thing that we might uh, take a look at is other states. Uh, let's say uh, you're coming from Montana, let's say, and you're coming to Vermont and you have an RV and you're, you're not stopping at anything along the way other than just to rest and get to Vermont. Uh, we might make allowances for something like that, but we're just contemplating that, uh, that concept at this point. All right, so keep, keep your ears peeled for road trips. I, I think uh, it just stay in the, this, uh, this, this 10 hour range. Uh, I think it's probably 10 hour at this point or thereabouts, depending on how fast you drive. Um, but, uh, but staying in this, in this region would be the best approach right now. Thank you. Greg, the County Courier. Greg, 
Greg, the County Courier. All right, we'll go to Mike, the Islander. Uh, thanks, Rebecca. Uh, uh, Dr. Levine, uh, I think there was some people were sort of uh, uh, interested that uh, the other day you said a uh, statistician was uh, making the calls as far as uh, whether Vermonters have provided relevant information to protect themselves, like identifying facilities with positive tests. I'm wondering the name of the statistician that you referred to, but and what is their official title or what they do at the health department? Hi, Mike. Uh, I, I hope you're not directly quoting me because I have no recollection of saying anything of the sort. Well, you were you said uh, in response, I thought, to the Fair Haven thing that uh, you weren't identifying the facilities based on statistician uh, saying that people would be able to figure out who. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. You know, yeah. Might, might have. It. Uh, yeah. Correctly. Uh, so you do. Okay. You do it. I'm not saying that now. Okay. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll say it differently. Who is the statistician? Yeah. I'll say it differently because um, I, I was not referring to a statistician. I was referring to the fact that we have a health surveillance arm that has epidemiologists and statisticians as part of it, and their data analysis shows us when a number is too small to. Uh, announce it uh, in any way that could betray the confidential and privileged health information of the individuals involved. So it's not that a person is making the call, it is they are giving us the information we need so that we know that if we take that information and provide it to the public, we're betraying the confidentiality of that information and the privileged nature for that set of individuals. It's the same reason why uh, we had the discussion with you earlier about how many cases there are in a particular town. Um, it all has to do with um, really statistical analysis and understanding of how that translates into a real person's life. Well, let me just, I want to follow up on that, but just a point of clarification. Uh, Fairhaven. So you didn't want to say that there were people going in and out and employees, there was no contact. Just to clarify, so the Postal Service has made no deliveries. Coca-Cola hasn't gone in to fill any soda machines. Food vendors don't go in to fill their machines. UPS, FedEx not making deliveries. Uh, no non-employees have entered the facility over the last whatever it is, week or so. Photocopier repair people haven't gone in to fix it or to install it or anything like that. You confirm that no, no single person has entered other than employees. I, I wouldn't want to confirm that completely for you because I'm not down there and haven't seen with my own eyes. But we've appropriately uh, identified those who need to be isolated and quarantined and those who can still be present at the facility. Okay, and, and to follow what you said about the Fair Haven facility and, and, and the numbers, obviously you've talked about Burlington Health and Rehab, the Bennington School, Birchwood, each of the correctional centers. Uh, I mean, there was discussion talking about an inmate from Florida that was admitted with uh, COVID. That would be pretty easy to figure out the jail registers or public record. Uh, you know, the, the Bennington Veterans Home, there was just one case you talked about the veteran phones, and uh, and one reader is wondering if the health department will identify any Vermont restaurant that might have a group of employees test positive, or will you withhold that from Vermonters, much like the Fair Haven facility, so potential diners are left in the dark, and you're not going to let them make a fully conscious decision about wanting to enter a restaurant. Yeah, so I'll 
I'll restate what I said at the outset of this conversation today, which is if we find through contact tracing that an individual is at risk, the health department will contact them. If the risk occurred in a public setting where people could have been put at risk and cannot otherwise be found, the health department would make a public announcement. So um, you may recall over the years, there have been foodborne illness outbreaks at various places that people could go and purchase food at. And generally, uh, we make that known if we cannot possibly trace every person who might have been there and might be at risk. So our goal is always, number one goal, protect and promote the health of all Vermonters. So if that is that goal is our overarching um, beam that we're heading towards, and we can't assure ourselves we've done that, we will make the kinds of announcements that we need to make to protect public health. Do you, do you understand that some taxpayers rather make their own decisions rather than the old government adage trust us? I mean, do you, do you understand that there are people telling us that they want full information disclosed and not pick and choose what the health department may think that the public ought to know? Uh, I guess you're informing me of that right now. But at the same time, uh, I would know that many individuals uh, would not want information made known that involved them, and uh, they need to be protected just as well. Again, we've never asked for any names. We've asked for facilities. You've given yeah. out facilities before, whether it's correctional centers, the health and rehab, whatever. So you pick and choose, and I think that's the frustration of Vermonters, is that it's not consistent with the health department. Yeah, well, I'll just argue back that with the numbers game that I was talking about earlier, uh, we need to be uh, conscious of the times when individual health information could be uh, conveyed, uh, or even groups of people, their information, uh, that could put them at some risk. I'll leave it at that. Uh, Secretary okay. Smith Thank wants to much. give you an extra comment. Yeah, I, I just wanted to come to the defense of, of Dr. Levine here. I, I've seen a vast majority of Vermonters respond to this um, virus with compassion, um, really to sort of uh, help their neighbors. and. We have not let this virus divide us. In fact, in many cases, this virus has strongly united us. There have been few instances, some that I have called out from this podium, where some wish to label or stigmatize those that, uh, through no fault of their own, have contracted the virus and we have rejected outright making any suggestions uh, in terms of, and I've seen this and I've called this out at this podium, you know, those that we have uh, suggested for isolation, uh, you know, uh, voluntary isolation. There have been some that said they should wear special uniforms or uh, designated symbols. Um, highlighting the fact that they have COVID. And for those rare cases, um, those are just rare cases. Let me just say this. We realize we have an obligation while protecting, to protect the general public. And we take that obligation very, very serious at the health department. And I'm very proud of what the health department has done. We are very careful very careful to avoid stigmatizing individuals or groups of individuals. That has been the desire that has been in place since we, this virus has started. Um, whether we're talking isolation facilities, whether we're talking Winooski, whether we're talking anywhere in Vermont. You ask us to be transparent and we are trying to be as transparent as possible through this entire, and we have, by the way, through this entire pandemic. 
what, oh, what, 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 just that. let me finish, Mike. Let, okay. let me finish, Mike. Let me finish. Sure. Yeah. But don't, please don't ask us to expand transparency at the expense of the point where we expose the identities of people or groups of people uh, that have contracted the virus through no fault of their own. And anyone could be in that situation. So we got to ask ourselves, would we like to have our information exposed where it would be very easy to be exposed in, the, in, this, in these particular cases? And in this case, the likelihood of identifying individuals or a group of individuals is likely in our estimation. So I just wanted to sort of set the table on this so that you and others could understand that we believe in transparency, that we believe in making sure that we, we have our obligation of, uh, of protecting the health of Vermonters. But at the same time, we've got to protect making sure the identities of individuals or groups of individuals. No, and I, I salute you for your transparency and things like that, but I, and I certainly, I'm not aware of who's tried to stigmatize anybody. It's more about education. Thank you. Aaron, VT Digger. Uh, Re Rebecca, this is uh, Greg from the County Courier. I wasn't able to unmute myself before Mike. Can I, can I jump in? Sure, go ahead. Hi, Governor and Dr. Levine. Um, I first just wanted a clarification from a reader uh, that wanted to know, are the rules the same for bars and restaurants, and are they the same for private bars and public bars? So private bars being like uh, BFW and uh, American Legions. Yeah, I, I believe so, um, Greg, but uh, Secretary Curley, are you on the line? I am on the line. Uh, yes, the rules are the same whether you are public or private. Okay, and, and bar or restaurant, it's the same? Yes, the, the guidelines are all on the ATCB website. Um, I think that, I, I don't know whether you're driving it, there are some that think bars are entirely closed. Um, bars are not necessarily entirely closed. It's important to look at the guidelines. We've given a path forward for bars to open um, with some guidelines, again, to keep people safe and healthy. So, um, but yes, the rules are the same whether you're public or private. Okay. Uh, and then I just wanted to follow up, uh, Dr. Levine, on Wednesday, um, I asked you uh, how long it would take to, to become a presumptive recovered case uh, if, if they weren't being currently tracked. Um, and, and you weren't really sure if it was like two weeks, 15 days, 30 days. Uh, I was supposed to get a follow up and I, I haven't heard from anyone. Now that you've had a chance to look that up, do you, do you know how people are being presumptively cleared or, or recovered? I don't have that information for you, but I will get it to you, hopefully before we're done here today. Okay, thank you. And uh, another quick follow-up. On Wednesday, I also talked about um, how it would be a whole lot more, more informative for Vermonters to know the current cases per county. Um, I had a reader reach out to me and, and inform me that in Massachusetts, and, and I did actually look this up to make sure the reader was correct, in Massachusetts the government's putting out town by town data on number of tests, the test rate per 1,000 residents, and what percentage of them is positive in addition to how many people uh, are, are believed to be current cases. Um, when when can Vermonters start expecting that kind of transparency on a town by town basis? Again, the numbers are going to be somewhat small for many towns. Um, I will task my department with trying to answer those questions. Okay. It's not in okay. an effort. It's and not in an effort to not be transparent. Um, 
but I'm not sure how, how meaningful some of the data might be. Well, I, I think it would be meaningful to know that, you know, in Enosburg we had, you know, 20 people get tested over three months versus, you know, 150. Um, and, and just to preempt the, uh, the statement that, you know, population numbers are too small, uh, Massachusetts is doing this with uh, towns and municipalities that are down, you know, a few hundred. Uh, sure. So if, if they're able to put out information on how many tests have, have been out in a town of, you know, several hundred people, I would think that, you know, we should be able to know how many people are, have been tested in, in St. Albans or Swanton or Enosburg. Thank you. We'll get back to you on that. Appreciate it. Thank you. Hope to hear from you before Monday. Have a great weekend. Aaron, VT Digger. Um, in the weekly uh, report about COVID-19 cases, I noticed that for the first time, I believe, the state has released data about healthcare workers that shows that one in five Vermonters with COVID-19 were healthcare workers, uh, well over 100 people. Um, if you the six hospitalizations as well. I, um, I'm wondering, you know, what Vermont kind of takes out of that data just in general, and also specifically, did the state feel like it was adequately protecting workers in terms of PPE and other protocols uh, during the worst of the epidemic? Yes. Uh, I didn't hear the question. I'm sorry. Oh, maybe we'll have a repeat of the question. Secretary Smith didn't hear it, um, but I'm wondering, Aaron, if you is this abnormal? Have you looked at other states to see if this is abnormal in terms of the? Is it a higher percentage than other states? Well, the tricky part about that is that states don't consistently release that data. Well, Mass um, Massachusetts for a Mass variety of reasons. Massachusetts does a lot of uh, data entry. Could you repeat the question? Oh, I can certainly take a look. Sorry. Yeah. I think the question, yeah. pardon me if I'm wrong, Aaron, but I think the question um, was one in five cases were healthcare workers. Do we have any insight as to why um, they might have, or do we consider that a high percentage and why might that happen? Is that correct? Yes. Um, also, just uh, it says, you know, Scott and Levine feel like healthcare workers were adequately protected with PPE and other measures uh, since the start of the crisis. You know, I, I will say, and I'll let Dr. Levine or Secretary Smith answer as well, but um, first of all, I think that uh, we have a number of healthcare providers who are interacting with the most vulnerable uh, all the time, uh, those impacted by uh, the coronavirus and those who could be. Uh, so they are always on the front line. So it would, uh, from my standpoint, it would make uh, make sense from a common sense standpoint uh, that they would be more vulnerable. We recognize that. I, I believe we've done a lot in terms of uh, making sure that they're protected with uh, PPEs. Uh, we've struggled, like other states, in trying to provide that, but we kept up uh, and prioritized that uh, to make sure that those frontline workers did have what they needed, uh, but it has been a struggle, admittedly. Uh, the other aspect is we have a, there's a high percentage, I, I believe, a high percentage of, uh, of workers, uh, employ, uh, employees in the healthcare industry in Vermont as well. So if you look at the, the spectrum of, uh, of the, the, the number of people in that industry, it's going to be high as well. So, uh, Commissioner Levine. I don't have a lot to add to that. Um, I'll have to make sure we understand the definition of healthcare worker uh, being quite broad because we're testing so many of them right now. Um, and fortunately, we're finding um, as we go into different kinds of facilities, um, not a lot of the staff that interact with patients uh, to be uh, affected by COVID. The, um, even the correctional facilities um, where we had one outbreak, we actually have found uh, very hardeningly um, most people were testing negative at those facilities. So I'm, you know, I'm realizing we have, you know, in the course of a week, 
you said we had in the 50s in the last week. So it would surprise me that that many would be healthcare workers, to be honest, because uh, at least I, uh, what? I, there's, yeah, there's a 50 in the last week. I, uh, the statistics that I have are one in five for modern with COVID-19 or healthcare workers. And right. that um, it seems to be between 100 or 200 total. That was, sorry. It's, yeah, no, no, but that's what I was just thinking. If there are 50s in the last week and one in five of them um, are COVID, um, that's still 10 people, uh, which seemed a little surprising. Mm -hmm. One to 200 out of our um, 14, 1500 cases still seems like a lot considering what people in the healthcare industry tell me, uh, but maybe that isn't so high uh, when I look at it in that ratio. It certainly would not be due to lack of PPE um, because I know that people adhere to that very, very strictly. We've had months go by now where we have adequate PPE for the healthcare workforce. So I wouldn't expect that number to be growing or be impacted by PPE at this point in time. Uh, so certainly that part of your question is easier to answer. Yeah, uh, I also wanted to know because you were talking about facilities that it says thirty-five percent of healthcare workers with COVID nineteen are associated with an outbreak. I don't know whether I would call that high or low um, mm -hmm. because I don't have comparative data. I just found it during the press conference call. Uh, but it, it does seem like some of these do appear to be tied to facility outbreaks. Yeah, and the, the other part of this <clears throat> is that we are uh, mandatorily testing more healthcare workers now. So many of them, uh, even if they have no symptoms, may be asymptomatic, may be testing positive, like a certain percentage of the general population will be testing positive as well. Because when we look at healthcare facility outbreaks, you know, beyond the two nursing homes from the very beginning of the pandemic in Vermont, we actually have not had a lot of uh, healthcare facilities that have had issues. So that's why I'm so surprised. So do you know how many uh, of the health, those healthcare workers that tested positive were at nursing homes specifically? I mean, I know yes. that it, it mentioned 35% outbreaks, but. Yes, so I remember from early on um, with the two nursing homes that had the biggest outbreaks, there's probably um, 100 healthcare workers in that group alone. Mm -hmm. And I can. Um, uh, get back with a precise number, but we've been tracking mm -hmm. that all along. So that number already accounts for uh, a big percentage of the ones that you've mentioned. Wait, so are you saying 100 healthcare workers worked in those facilities or 100 healthcare workers tested positive? Tested in positive facilities? in those facilities. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. yeah. And that's why we had that's why we had tremendous concerns about making sure that those facilities had a stream of workers to uh, substitute in, if you will, for those who had to be isolated or quarantined. Yeah, yeah. Um, is there any reason why you know how the Department of Health handles nursing home outbreaks if they want to close again? Oh, it's it's already affected that. Uh, since that was so early in the game, um, the, the number of uh, initiatives that have occurred is tremendous. Um, there's testing of all new admissions <clears throat> at the time of admission, and if they're negative, testing them over a two-week period every three days or so. There's quarantining of all new admissions at the time so that if they are incubating infection, they're not out in the general population of the nursing home. There's testing of people who have frequent visits to the community, like dialysis patients, uh, on a regular basis. Um, and there are being put into play now uh, new testing protocols for the staff and the residents of those facilities as part of the restart process to enable them to 
uh, begin to think about ways that they might ease up on some of the restrictiveness of visitation and of uh, residents gathering together in group settings. So there's a tremendous amount that's happened uh, as a result of that. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, hopefully, quick question uh, for Smith. Are there any updates on the prison uh, outbreak? Well, sorry, the prisoners that have tested positive. Have there been any more um, positives since we last talked? Yeah, Secretary Smith. Aaron, with, um, here's where we are, where we stand today. We tested uh, Chittenden Regional Correctional Facility on Wednesday. All the completed tests were negative. We did have two inmates that refused uh, testing. There, they were placed in isolation for 14 days. Those, those are isolation facilities, medical facilities, not um, anything else. Um, we had um, we had some staff, nine remaining staff that need to be tested. They were either on leave or they requested to have their uh, test done by their primary care doctor. Any, just so everybody knows, any staff that were not uh, tested during uh, this round or are waiting results uh, from the uh, primary care uh, provider will not be allowed back into the facility until they have proof of a negative test. Um, we have some new information uh, this morning that I can report about the positive tests that we reported on, on Wednesday at Northwest. As you recall, um, that individual was tested on the 19th. It was returned negative on the 20th. On the 22nd, he was tested again, and it came back positive on the 23rd he was tested again and it came back negative uh, the inmate is still in quarantine and contact tracing is underway on staff and inmates uh, just to again to uh, I, I gave you a lot on Wednesday I just want to give you some updates all staff and inmates at uh, Marble Marble Valley Regional Correctional Facility were tested last Saturday. They're going to all those tests came back negative. The staff and inmates will be tested again on Monday, June 29th, and then beginning on June 6th, the Vermont Department of Corrections and the Department of Health will be doing mass testing of one facility each week. Uh, first up will be Northwest State Correctional Facility. So that is the update that I've got for you, Erin. All right, thank you very much. Joe, the Barton Chronicle. Hello, Governor. Um, I understand that um, the decision to keep the border between the U.S. and Canada closed is at least nominally um, a decision by both countries. But at present, um, do you have any information about which side of the border is more eager to uh, keep it from reopening and where the border to be reopened? How, how many parts of Quebec, how many townships would fall under the 400 uh, limit for active cases per million? And um, would we possibly see a large number of people being able to come to Vermont from Canada if the border were open? Um, the first part of your question, I, I have no idea uh, other than it was mutually agreed upon. Uh, so I think uh, both sides have come to the conclusion it was a good idea to continue uh, to have the border closed. Um, I watch uh, the Quebec numbers as well as uh, some of the regional numbers, and they're getting much, much better as well. Uh, I've asked uh, Commissioner Pichek uh, to keep track of that in anticipation of the opening of the border so that we can do the same thing that we're doing here. I don't know if they call them uh, counties there or their ridings or what they are, but, uh, but uh, whatever designation they have, we want to use the same methodology. And, and I believe, though, that when I'm looking at the Quebec numbers, uh, they're looking uh, a lot better, uh, similar to other regions in the Northeast. So 
I would anticipate most of Quebec uh, would be open back up and beyond that. I'm not sure. Uh, Commissioner Pichek, is there anything you can add? To what I, I, I have uh, nothing that Commissioner Pichek can add at this point. But we are anticipating when that does open that we'll be able to release that data. Okay. Thank you very much. Elizabeth Hewitt, VT Duger. Hi. Um, so thank you, Regional Hockey Camp and JP that's been going on earlier this week and uh, mostly involving folks from out of state. I'm wondering if the state is monitoring whether there's adherence to social guidelines of the campers and their families and if you've had any complaints about this. I might uh, refer to Secretary Curley or Commissioner Sherling on this in terms of complaints. Um, I ha it hasn't risen to my level at, the, at this point in time. Uh, yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Lindy. I was just going to say that um, we um, have not received any complaints at the Agency of Commerce. Um, they are able to operate a overnight camp based on the camp guidelines that are on our website. And um, we, to, to my knowledge, things are going okay, but I, I haven't heard anything to the contrary. Commissioner Sherman. Sure. Same answer, Governor. I haven't heard anything uh, about that location. Okay, thank you. And if I can follow up very quickly, I have a logistical question. Um, with the uh, expansion of the travel region, um, as you mentioned earlier, Governor, some of these uh, places are up to 10 hours uh, thereabouts away, um, which is farther than one could realistically drive without stopping for very pit stops. Um, what are the guidelines? For, for folks that are traveling by personal car when they're making stops, um, when they have to make a travel on the way. Yeah, I would, I would say, um, and I'll let others weigh in on this, but uh, understanding that people are going to have to stop for fuel and food and so forth, uh, but to maintain uh, the same guidelines that we are asking Vermonters to adhere to now individually, you know, maintain some social or physical distance, wash your hands a lot, um, you know, wear a mask whenever you go into uh, a location. Just adhere to those common sense measures, and, and uh, I think you'll get here safely. Anything else, uh, Commissioner Levine? The only that addition would be that's probably a great time to bring sanitizer with you because there's so many unpredictable things that might happen when you stop, and you may have already washed your hands, and then you're pumping gas. Uh, so have the sanitizer available. Thank you. Steve, NEKTV. Um, hello, can you hear me? We can. Uh, great. I, I wanted to uh, quick thank you uh, to the administration for holding these conferences, uh, to WCAX for uh, running them live. It's a public service in the highest degree. And uh, Orca Media for throwing them up on the web so quickly. Um, I got a quick question for I, Dr. I would add uh, Ch Ch 22 and 44, as well as WPTZ uh, to that list. Uh, they're both here and putting it up live as well. Yeah, but I don't see them being broadcast. Anyway. Uh, I think, I um, believe they are, but maybe you don't oh, get that okay. channel up in the Northeast Kingdom. <laughs> yeah, I got I to gotta boot my antenna, I guess. Yeah. Uh, a, a quick one for uh, uh, Dr. Levine. Um, and then for the governor. Um, Dr. Levine, given the importance of hand washing and, you know, uh, stuff like that, hot, with the availability of hot water, uh, w wouldn't it make sense to, uh, to, to open the rest areas to have access to uh, facilities with, uh, with hot water? This is by far the biggest complaint I hear from everybody up here is about the rest areas. Yeah, um, Steve, instead of uh, Dr. Levine, I think he would agree that uh, anytime we can provide ways that people can, you know, in a sanitary way, uh, get to um, some of these locations would be, would be uh, good for all of us. Um, we're trying, uh, we're opening uh, some of the rest areas as, as we speak. Uh, Secretary Young, do you have a, a report on that? Uh, interesting, Governor. I, I just received an update from the Commissioner of PGS that I should be getting a uh, 
plan for reopening today. Uh, I would remind um, folks that when we did shut down the facilities, the buildings uh, at the rest areas early on, uh, we did make sure that we had um, at least uh, portalettes at every facility, and we have um, been very, very, um, I think, uh, judicious about checking them, keeping them clean, and keeping them um, uh, filled with sanitizer to the extent we could. Uh, so there are places to, to stop. Um, it's just that the buildings themselves are not open, and we're working on a plan to do that safely. Um, great, because uh, that's, uh, I, yeah, I've had complaints about the porta parties, not anything about them specifically, but that they just don't compare to, uh, to, to hot water. And uh, uh, Governor, regarding the graffiti thing, um, I, 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 I liked how you, you jumped to the, to the message about Yankee on a train trestle, which is railroad property. I mean, obviously the, the railroads are not known for uh, uh, their maintenance these days. Uh, but regarding the, the, the email that went out, it said that the change in policy had specifically come from your office and um, and that uh, having paint, you know, I mean, chalk is one thing, uh, but having paint in the in the right of way, um, I believe you've got a motorcycle endorsement. Uh, I mean, when you hit paint with with a motorcycle or even pedestrians, and in the messages, I mean, uh, you talk about not censoring. It says to, to use this opportunity to advance the discussion rather than censoring it. I mean, what would be allowable? I mean, would somebody be able to, to paint something like Phil Scott is a blankety blank blank? I mean, I, I mean, who is the final arbiter? And, 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 and I mean, how far will this go? Yeah, um, I, I would say, first of all, in terms of the, the trestle, <clears throat> a lot of that is under uh, the control and lease back uh, to the railroads, at least half the state is. Um, so it is under our control, and we certainly uh, could give guidance in, in that manner. Um, I'm going to read you the, the guidance uh, so that everyone understands who hasn't read it yet, as Steve has, uh, what it actually says. <clears throat> so this is the guidance. All signs that negatively affect roadway safety shall be removed regardless of content. Second, if a sign is not either profane, grotesque, advocates illegal activity, or violence, it should be allowed to remain. Any mural or paint applied to a highway sign shall be removed regardless of content. For, mural, for murals painted on bridges and walls, if a mural contains messages or images that are not either profane, grotesque, advocate illegal activity or violence, it should be allowed to remain. Any all or all murals should be photographed prior to removal or painting over. If you, and this is, uh, was addressed uh, to the maintenance districts, if you or your staff have any questions on content and are not sure whether a sign or mural should be removed or, or encounter a situ situation not contemplated in the guidance, please send a picture to the chief engineer's office for assistance. End of story. Okay, but I, what I, you know, the signs and murals, uh, obviously, but in, in the highway right of way, uh, isn't that dangerous for, for motorcycles and wet trap? Uh, wet, well, we, uh, we have, we have, uh, again, we, we haven't uh, contemplated that on the, on the highways or on the roadway surfaces themselves, but as a reminder, uh, that's how we, uh, uh, we have all the pavement markings are with paint. Uh, in the middle of the highway, on the on the edges, and so forth. But uh, I get your point. Um, some are more dangerous than others uh, when there's water applied to them, uh, especially on a motorcycle. But uh, uh, we paint them now. Okay. Um, it, I, I appreciate uh, you clarifying this, um, and uh, we hope we can get the uh, get the rest areas up. It's the biggest thing I'm hearing from everybody. Yeah, we know, you know, we're expanding the areas that uh, we're accepting more uh, people to come visit. Uh, so we know uh, we want to be as welcoming as possible and uh, get those open just as quick as we possibly can. 
Great. Um, uh, thanks again. Okay. Um, thanks to everybody. All right, Riley, Burlington Free Press. <laughs> Um, my question is for the governor. So a number of colleges and universities around Vermont have recently announced that they plan to welcome students back to campus in the fall. I had two questions about that. The first is when you're planning to announce guidelines for those colleges and universities. And the second is what conditions it would take to lock down or evacuate schools in the fall. Um, we are going to, uh, the guidance will be out in the next week or so, uh, uh, Secretary, uh, Deputy Secretary uh, Brady is working on that in conjunction with the uh, uh, higher education community. Uh, so we'll have something out in the next week or so. So hopefully uh, some of that guidance will spell out when, when that might be an issue. Uh, anything, uh, Dr. Levine, you'd like to add to that? Yeah. No, we're very close. Yeah, we're getting closer uh, to the guidance, so uh, you should see something uh, again in the next week or two. Okay, thank you. Is that where information? <clears throat> pardon me. Is that where information about what would what would necessitate an evacuation or lockdown would? Would be yeah, fully I, I, yes, I believe that the guidance will will show that, and certainly in uh, communications uh, with some of these universities and colleges, uh, will dictate when that happens because we want to anticipate anything of that nature. Great, thank you, Bridget, the Milton Independent. Star six to hello. Oh, thank you, Brian. Go, go ahead. Hello, thank you very much for having me today. Um, my question is regards to the hospitality industry. Um, what guidelines or advice do you have for hospitality workers, people who own bed and breakfast, um, who share uh, living or communal spaces with uh, their visitors and people staying at their inns? Yeah, again, those simple guidelines that we, uh, we had laid out, uh, I think, adhere uh, to almost to every situation and uh, trying to, you know, make sure that you're protecting yourself and others. Our physical uh, separation is important. Uh, cleanliness, uh, hygiene is uh, also important. Wash your hands a lot. Um, there, I'm sure there's others uh, in, the, in the guidance as well. Yeah, on the ACCD uh, page uh, that, would, uh, that would give them other uh, tips uh, as well. And to keep, again, keep their guests safe and keep themselves safe as well. Secretary Curley, is there anything I should add to that? Uh, no, Governor, you're right. There's there's information on the, the website, and um, I will just say that we have a, a great communication um, stream going through with our Commissioner of Tourism and Marketing, um, and we find that, that the folks that are operating bed and breakfast or where they're more closely connected with guests, they, um, they definitely have a a great uh, desire to keep themselves safe and to keep their guests safe. So, um, the same guidelines for everyone that they're on the website. Again, accd.vermont.gov. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, Bridget. Uh, that's everybody on the Great. Well, again, thank you very much. Have a safe weekend, and we'll see you on Monday.